In my opinion, the first episode of Band of Brothers is the most accurate to history other than a couple of individuals, David Webster and Roy Cobb, being present at Takoa when they weren't actually with Easy Company at the time. This is due to the fact that the writer obviously used both Donald Malarkey's and Richard Winter's memoirs instead of a combination of the Band of Brothers book and their own imagination. It's just a shame that the rest of the series, perhaps except for episode 10, points, is more fiction than fact. The following is an account of Don Malarkey's arrival at Camp Tacoa and training under Captain Herbert Sobel. You will notice many similarities with the series. Camp Takoa was located in the Chattahoochee National Forest, not far from the town from which the camp got its name. It had been purposely built to serve the formation of an experimental regiment that would coincide with the parachute school at Fort Benning, also in Georgia. At any one time, around 6,000 men called Takoa home. Three quarters of these recruits would soon quit or be washed out. The rest would become qualified paratroopers. By the time Donald Malarkey arrived, the regiment was mostly formed and Malarkey felt a bit uneasy about fitting in. Newcomers were placed in W Company, a tented area just below the regimental medical facility. The W they soon learned stood for either welcome or washout because as new men were coming in, a group of guys were just as quickly going out. Once assigned to Easy Company, Malarkey had trouble just getting his cot put together so couldn't understand what had made him think he could possibly qualify for this elite group of soldiers. He had already shown his inexperience by running into an officer he had known back at the University of Oregon, Eugene Brown, and calling him by his name instead of saluting him. He had also heard that the group of guys leaving had been booted because of their inability to run up and down something called Kurahi. He asked one of the other men who were on their way out of the camp what Kurahi was, to which the guy replied, screw you pal, as he flung his duffel bag over his shoulder. Malarkey would soon find out exactly what it was. Kurahi was a mountain, introduced to him by the first guy in Easy Company, Don became friends with Rod Bain. He had been putting his shaving kit away on a shelf that had a photo of a young woman on it. When Malarkey looked closer, he noticed that she was not only beautiful, but the name of the photo studio in the corner was Wilson's Studio, Astoria, Oregon. Who's the photo of? He asked Rod, that's my sister, he replied. It was taken in Astoria, where I'm from, Malarkey stated. Bain replied that he was from right across the Columbia, in Ilwaco, Washington. Here Don was, 2,000 miles away, and the guy bunking next to him was a ferry ride away from where he lived. They weren't the only Northwesterners. Tom Burgess was from Centralia, Washington, and John Plesh was from Seattle, Rainier Valley. Malarkey was invited to join Bain for an after-dinner run-up curahi. It would be an unofficial introduction so that he could understand what he would be up against daily at Camp Takoa. So that night, after chow, they walked to the foot of the mountain. Burgess joined them. Curahi, explained Bain, was the measuring stick for every individual, and quitting was the fastest ticket out of the regiment. If it was Bain's intention to scare Malarkey, it worked. When after a half mile up the three mile long logging road twisting through the pines, he and Burgess were gliding along and Don was sucking eggs. Near the top, he thought he was going to lose his dinner. On the way down, he thought he was going to lose everything he'd eaten since high school. It took about two hours, but finally he made it. At the bottom of the hill, Bain slapped him on the back in congratulation. Running the mountain became an obsession for many of the recruits who would curse every word under the sun while going up it under instruction during the day, only to return on their own or in small groups to do it again that same evening. As the men doubled over to catch their breath, Bain explained that Kurahi was an Indian word that meant standing alone. The battle cry of the 506th was, We stand alone together. Kurahi, he yelled. Kurahi, followed Burgess. Despite being bent over with his hands on his knees, trying to catch his breath, Malarkey straightened up and feeling like he had somehow earned some tiny rite of passage, shouted his first Kurahi battle cry. That night while lying in his bunk, Don wasn't thinking about how far away from Oregon he was, or about his sore legs, or about how a single mosquito could spoil a night's sleep. He was instead thinking, what kind of a special group of guys was this, that a couple of them, guys who didn't even know him, 
would run up a mountain just for his benefit. Was it to help him prepare for what was to come? It was certainly a positive welcome instead of being trampled down like in many other branches of the military. It might have seemed a simple thing, but Don never forgot that gesture. It was his first bonding experience with a group of men who would one day become known as the Band of Brothers, a name which originated from Shakespeare's Henry V in 1598. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. That label would be given to those in easy company decades after the war was over. The 101st Airborne Division, otherwise known as the Screaming Eagles, formed in 1942. The 82nd Airborne had been the first American division to train men for assault from the air. Major General William C. Lee promised his men that although the 101st had no history, they had a rendezvous with destiny. And a hell of a rendezvous it would be. The 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment was one of three such regiments in the 101st, the others being the 501st and the 502nd. Each regiment had three battalions. A, B, and C companies were assigned to the 1st Battalion. D, E, and F was assigned to the 2nd, with G, H, and I assigned to the 3rd. Easy Company, around 150 men strong, was divided into four platoons of 40 to 50 men each. Malarkey had been assigned to Easy's 2nd platoon under the leadership of 2nd Lieutenant Richard Dick Winters and several sergeants including Charles Chuck Grant and William Bill Garnier. At Takoa, virtually everything was at first some kind of physical challenge. Run Kirahi three or four times a week, run a hillside obstacle course over a stack of timber, under netting strewn with hog guts, through wooden chutes that left splinters in hands, push-ups, sit-ups, windmills, somersaults, and then, on a Friday night, while the rest of the regiment were enjoying the local town, Easy would be on a forced march, starting out at five miles and adding five miles each week until the grand finale, a 50-miler. Talking was not permitted, but toughest of all was the no smoking since nearly all of the men smoked like chimneys. There was no food, no water, and no stopping. The other companies never experienced such hardship during training, and that they let the men of Easy know all about it. Malarkey soon realized why his company stood apart from the others, and it was mainly because they were led by Captain Herbert Sobel, the man who demanded the 50 milers and the hog guts in your face obstacle courses. The men of Easy Company do not quit, he'd yell on our way up that mountain. At times, he'd have officers sweep through the ranks checking our musette bags and canteens for food and water. Sobel had it in for Lieutenant Winters and was tougher than nails on him, almost as if Winters was an enlisted man instead of one of the officers. After a week of sheer hell, Sobel would announce they were being rewarded with a big dinner. They would be halfway through the spaghetti when he'd walk in. The men would all snap to attention and he'd yell, Gear on! We're going up Kurahi! Even in the downtime, Sobel would find ways to make them miserable. Easy company inspections were legendary at Takoa. Sobel would call at any odd hour, bursting into the barracks with complete surprise. Then guys would disappear just like that, never to be heard of again. They simply couldn't cut it, and they likely couldn't handle Sobel. Once, the captain paid a surprise visit and confiscated all sorts of personal property. There was everything from unauthorized ammunition to a lifetime supply of rubbers to a can of peaches. Anyone who disliked him before that incident hated him after it. I'd like to kill that SOB, someone would mutter. Sobel was tall and would stare you down, raising his voice just enough to upset the most patient of men. Dirt on the rifle hinge spring malarkey. Weekend pass revoked. Lint on chevrons revoked. A rusty bayonet revoked. Don't like the sound of your name revoked. At times, when more than one recruit had screwed up, he'd punish the whole platoon. If there was a big dance or party they were all going to in town, he would cancel all passes. It was as if he were trying to make the men hate him. Or maybe it was all premeditated, designed to turn a bunch of newbies into a single united company. Sometimes as punishment, he would make someone sleep with a machine gun in their cot, or go dig a six foot by six foot hole in the ground, then fill it back in. Jimmy Alley was always digging holes. Once while inspecting the second platoon, Sobel stopped and eyeballed a kid named Frederick Belke, who was 17 years old and had never shaved in his life. 
All he had was peach fuzz. Sobel announced to the whole platoon that Belki was restricted for being unshaven, so the rest were restricted as well. To avoid any future punishments, they tied the kid down and shaved him themselves. Some called Sobel the black swan because he had a dark complexion and ran like a duck, legs flapping here and there, but he always did what he asked his men to do. He would get to the top of the mountain with a stopwatch in his hand. This might be good enough for the rest of the 506th, but it's sure as hell not good enough for easy company. In a strange way, it filled the men with pride and determination. Malarkey got the idea he was hardening them for tougher times to come, and that he truly wanted easy to be the best company in the regiment and believe they could be. The company eventually established the finest fitness record in the 506th, but when some colonel from another division saw the results, he requested that someone from Washington travel to Georgia to retest them. Ironically, they got an even higher score. Easy Company were becoming exactly what Sobel wanted them to be, the best. But just when the men were full of pride, not that Sobel ever told them he was proud, he'd find a way to undo everything. He wanted the company to succeed as a whole, but each man to fail so that he could belittle them. Warren Skip Muck once referred to Sobol as the devil in jump boots, and by the time Malarkey left Takoa, he wanted to use him for slingshot practice. In the months to come, things would happen in training that would make a lot of the men wonder if he was going to get them killed in combat someday. But when the war ended, Malarkey wondered if he wasn't a big reason some of them were still alive. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy the content, please consider giving the video a like, and why not join the growing war and truth community with a free subscription to the channel.